Arise, take your place, be and throw on a praise. Arise, King of kings, holy God, as we sing. Arise, arise. Come on, let's give him praise. One thing we ask of you, and one thing that we desire, that as we worship you, Lord, come and change our lives. Arise, arise. Oh, take your place, be and throne on our praise. King of kings, holy one, hey. as we sing, arise, arise. arise. Hallelujah. Dearly beloved, you are welcome to this morning's service. This morning we want to come before the Lord in prayer. We want to come before the Lord with a heart of gratitude. We want to say thank you to the Lord for all the good things that he has done for us. The Bible says that it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. And so, brethren, wherever you are, from the depths of your hearts, you want to say thank you to God for the many blessings he has bestowed upon our lives, even in this season of fasting and prayers. Father, we give you the praise that only you deserve. This morning, we want to ascribe all the glory and all the honor to the Lord for he is a good God and there is none like him. We just want to ponder in your heart and reflect over the goodness of the Lord. Yes, the Lord has been faithful. I bring you greetings from yes. the Powerhouse Ministries International. My name is Bernard Adiakwa, Senior Pastor. I want to invite you to all our services on Sunday morning, the first at 8 a.m., which is live streamed, and the second at 10 a.m. It's a service designed specifically to meet your needs very practical, very educative, very inspiring. You will definitely be drawn closer to have fellowship with God and into the presence of the Lord. I want to see you this Sunday and every other Sunday. Don't come alone. Bring your family and friends for an encounter with the living God. You definitely will be blessed by the word of God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I bring you greetings from the Powerhouse Ministries International. My name is Bernard Adiakwa, Senior Pastor. I want to invite you to all our services on Sunday morning, the 
first at 8 a.m., which is live streamed, and the second at 10 a.m. It's a service designed specifically to meet your needs. Very practical, very educative, very inspiring. You will definitely be drawn closer to have fellowship with God and into the presence of the Lord. I want to see you this Sunday and every other Sunday. Don't come alone. Bring your family and friends for an encounter with the living God. You definitely will be blessed by the word of God. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I bring you greetings from the Powerhouse Ministries International. My name is Bernard Adiakwa, Senior Pastor. I want to invite you to all our services on Sunday morning, the first at 8 a.m., which is live streamed, and the second at 10 a.m. It's a service designed specifically to meet your needs. Very practical, very educative, very inspiring. You will definitely be drawn closer to have fellowship with God and into the presence of the Lord. I want to see you this Sunday and every other Sunday. Don't come alone. Bring your family and friends for an encounter with the living God. You definitely will be blessed by the word of God. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I bring you greetings from the Powerhouse Ministries International. My name is Bernard Adiakwa, Senior Pastor. I want to invite you to all our services on Sunday morning, the first at 8 a.m., which is live streamed, and the second at 10 a.m. It's a service designed specifically to meet your needs. Very practical, very educative, very inspiring. You will definitely be drawn closer to have fellowship with God and into the presence of the Lord. I want to see you this Sunday and every other Sunday. Don't come alone. Bring your family and friends for an encounter with the living God. You definitely will be blessed by the word of God. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I bring you greetings from the Powerhouse Ministries International. My name is Bernard Adiakwa, Senior Pastor. I want to invite you to all our services on Sunday morning, the first at 8 a.m., which is live streamed and the second at 10 a.m. It's a service designed specifically to meet your needs. Very practical, very educative, very inspiring. You will definitely be drawn closer to have fellowship with God and into the presence of the Lord. I want to see you this Sunday and every other Sunday. Don't come alone. Bring your family and friends for an encounter with the living God. You definitely will be blessed by the word of God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I bring you greetings from the Powerhouse Ministries International. My name is Bernard Adiakwa, Senior Pastor. I want to invite you to all our services on Sunday morning, the first at 8 a.m., which is live streamed, and the second at 10 a.m. It's a service designed specifically to meet your needs. Very practical, very educative, very inspiring. You will definitely be drawn closer to have fellowship with God and into the presence of the Lord. I want to see you this Sunday and every other Sunday. Don't come alone. Bring your family and friends for an encounter with the living God. You definitely will be blessed by the word of God. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I bring you greetings from the Powerhouse Ministries International. My name is Bernard Adiakwa, Senior Pastor. I want to invite you to all our services on Sunday morning, the first at 8 a.m., which is live streamed, and the second at 10 a.m. It's a service designed specifically to meet your needs. Very practical, very educative, very inspiring. You will definitely be drawn closer to have fellowship with God and into the presence of the Lord. I want to see you this Sunday and every other Sunday. Don't come alone. Bring your family and friends for an encounter with the living God. You definitely will be blessed by the word of God. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I bring you greetings from the Powerhouse Ministries International. My name is... 
that whatever we do, oh God, that may your blessings be evident in our lives. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The Father this morning shall work in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. In the name of Jesus. Father, help us, oh God. Work in us, oh God. May your blessings work in us. Work in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. This is our cry this morning, oh God. That you shall be pleased with our service. You shall be pleased with our lives, oh God. May our lives give you honor. You want to pray this morning that, Father, may my life give you honor. May my life give you honor. May the Lord be glorified with our service. In the name of Jesus, that we shall show ourselves a pattern of good works. In our speech, in our way of life, in our conduct, in our actions. That we shall show ourselves a pattern of good works. That the Lord shall be honored through our lives. In the name of Jesus. And finally this morning, I want to pray that Father, may we love you. And may we honor you with our substance. May we honor the Lord with our first fruits. I want to pray this morning that Father, help me to honor you with my substance. Even as I come before your presence this morning. That we shall honor the Lord with our substance. We shall come back to honor the Lord. Through our pledge of allegiance, through our offerings of our sins, we may the Lord I'm a friend you and a supporter this, of Powerhouse. Oh God. Pastor Bernard is a Father, classmate and a good friend. Come back to and you. I've been quite, yes, prayer, oh God, uh, should I say, impressed by the service. vision of the church. May and that has honored, oh led me to be a, a supporter us, of the oh God, ministry of Powerhouse. So in terms of experiences, um, uh, just about almost a couple of years ago, my Father, brother fell ill and he was admitted in Kolibu for quite a few sessions here at cancer and I mentioned to Pastor Bernard about it and there was one particular instance when he needed a blood transfusion and as you know in Ghana sometimes this can be pretty tricky there was a shortage and, you know, and I discovered the powerhouse was a registered blood donor in Kolibu and so they could uh, they had some, uh, should I say, ability to provide blood. And that that was a big help. And it was also Hallelujah. pastor coming over to pray with him. And unknown to me, he came one day, um, just as I was also coming to visit him. I heard he had been there. That, that was something that touched me quite a bit. Um, my brother didn't know him, but he just went in and looked for him. And went in to pray with him a number of times. So. Oh, come on, that wherever was you particularly are, touching. You know, at those times, you are really sort of uh, quite stressed and, and, and drawn out. As and we that's wait on the Lord, want to say that Father, draw me close Well, the other thing is the music. You want more of um, I really voice. enjoy and yes, I'm Father, touched by the ministry, the music ministry of the church. Um, it's one of the things I look forward to every time there's a program. You know, uh, sometimes it's a bit difficult to keep your eyes from tearing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great. I, I really, I really am blessed by the music ministry. So, um, one of the things that particularly touched me about Powerhouse was the vision for the community. And when Pastor shared why he had located the church where he did and his passion for the people, in fact, that's one of the things you don't find very much in churches today. Um, you know, there's a tendency to focus on bringing the well healed to line the, the, the treasury of the church but this is where you see a church which is more reaching out to the people not just to bring them to Christ but also to lift their horizons to to empower them to see what they could do and be so in that sense I see the future of our house as transformational I mean I'm looking forward to see what the impact on those who have been taken through school who have been given a bigger sense of what they can do with the power of Christ in them reaching out to their communities when they themselves come on lift up your voice lift up your voice let's tell the Lord I don't try to imagine it but I believe it on your 25th anniversary I just thank God for Pastor Bernard and for the ministry team for all the members who have supported because a minister on his own can do so much 
with the support of his ministry team, his congregation. I just love the relationship that he has with his church members. You know, he's not up there and yet somewhere else. There's a true bond of fellowship there. And I wish you all the very best that God would continue to bless the church and bless the membership and bless the fellowship that you have to have. I know it's been a great thing for the year to watch Mata 1988. It's our sort of family church. We come there every so often. I'm sure we have many good times together. So, give God's blessing.
place, oh God, be enthroned on our praise. Hey, arise, arise. Put your hands together for the name of the Lord in this place. Amen. May the Lord arise in this place. Amen. You're welcome to our online service again. 
on behalf of our senior pastor and the entire PMI congregation, we welcome you to the presence of the Most High God. Remember that this is our year of influence, and this year we promise that we will honor the Lord with our service, and we will honor the Lord with our substance. Amen. We have come to another important part of the service, which is our tithe and our offerings. We want to remember that offerings are a sacred and a cardinal part of our faith. Remember that Jesus is an offering from God and the shed blood which we plead over our lives. May the blood speak better things for you this morning in the name of Jesus. You want to start with our offerings with our tithe. So if you are here with your tithe and your first fruit, I encourage you to come up front as we pray for you. If you are joining us virtually, you want to connect by faith and also give your tithe and your first fruit in the name of Jesus. The Bible says that the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. Genesis chapter 4, verse number 4. If you are here with your tithe, you want to come up front as we pray with you. And if you are joining us virtually, you want to just pray for those who are joining us virtually. Father, may you have respect for our tithe, our first fruits this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now for our offering, the Bible says give and it shall be given back to you. You want to lift up your free will offerings this morning. You want to dedicate it unto the Lord and honor it in the name of Jesus. Father, accept our free will offerings this morning. May it give you honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Want to come from the back as we honor the Lord this morning. Bible says that thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established. As we are in this prayer and fasting time, you want to make sure that you decree certain things for it to be established this year. As we declare our prophetic declarations, may it come to pass this year in our lives in Jesus' name. Shall we declare them together? Our Heavenly Father, creator of the heavens and the earth, the Alpha and Omega, hallowed be your name. Truly, you are indescribable more precious and valuable than anything we can ever imagine. We are blessed and honored to have you as Lord and also to be called your own inheritance, a chosen generation called to show forth your praises. Out of a deep sense of gratitude and conviction in my heart, I commit to love you and to seek you earnestly with all my heart, to faithfully and diligently serve your kingdom, to speak and do the word, I receive and believe your word to me with all my heart. For with my God, all things are possible. And I boldly declare, I am a chosen generation, called out of darkness into your marvelous light, to show forth your excellence. I am special, selected, handpicked, and set apart for your divine purpose. I am blessed and endowed with divine wisdom, to provide uncommon and outstanding leadership. I am the delight of kings and nobles. My impact and influence is generational and significant, even in strange and foreign lands. When I speak, all creation hears me. I am for signs and wonders. Like a city on a hill, I cannot be hid. My light has broken forth suddenly, and my influence is a sweet fragrance all over the earth. Divine prosperity is my portion. You lead me forth with silver and gold, and my bands are filled with abundance. I am blessed all over and everywhere. You feed me with the heritage of Jacob and make me great and honorable. You spread a cloud to cover me and fire to give light in the night for my divine protection. You suffer no man to do me wrong and reprove kings for my sake. Even in the wilderness, you satisfy me with the bread of heaven and water by your divine provision. You fill my life and my house with shouts of joy and gladness all the days of my life and give me an inheritance beyond my natural abilities and efforts. Father, I thank you for choosing me and blessing me with your word beyond my human efforts and abilities, beyond my limitations and inadequacies. I receive your word with all my heart. 
Lord, let it be done unto me according to thy word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to give the Lord a clap offering in this place. Amen. When you move, such an easy thing for you to do. Your hand is moving right now. You are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus. And your voice is calling me out. together come on let's celebrate our god who has never lost a battle hallelujah amen it's good to be in the house of the lord i welcome all of you to our online service this morning wherever you are gather your family friends join us for an exciting time in the presence of the lord um just an announcement for all of you in the next few weeks we shall be resuming our service at 7:30. And therefore, take note, it will no longer be at 8 o'clock, maybe possibly in February. So we'll keep announcing it. Check your online status and know so that you don't miss the service. Shall we pray? This morning, you want to honor the Lord with your presence in this place, with your sacrifice, your labor, 
and in everything we do, let it be honorable. You want to yield yourself as an instrument of righteousness. And so you want to lift up your hand and just pray to God and say, the Father, that I may honor you. That I may honor you. Everything I do, my presence here will bring you honor. My actions, my speech, my demeanor, the public reading of the scripture, the anticipation of what you're about to do. Let it bring you honor. My service in whatever area, let it bring you honor. Let the word that is spoken in this place, let it bring God honor in the name of Jesus. Father, speak to us and let your word fall on fertile ground and let it bring forth fruit of honor to your mighty name. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Today, I am speaking on what I call the offerings of honor. The offerings of honor. Who do you honor and how do you honor the person? Honoring somebody reveals and describes what you value. You are your offerings. Your offerings are a revelation of who you are and what you think about yourself. You cannot give what you do not have. And what you give is a true reflection of who you are. Turn your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 2. And let's read verse 29 and 30, which has become a theme verse for Anna. And in this, the Lord talks to Eli and rebukes him and says, Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in mine habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever, but now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Let's all say together, for them that honor me, I will honor. Say it again. For them that honor me, I will honor. This whole saga revolves around how the children of Eli handled the offerings. How you give, how you receive, and how you treat offerings. Offerings are a sacred part of our relationship with God and must be handled with a lot of honor, reverence, and respect. Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, treated and lightly esteemed what God valued, their reception and their attitude and the way they treated the offering was wrong. Last week, we studied examples of Hezekiah and how the people who lived with him obeyed the commandment of God to bring their first fruits and the impact that created over three to four months. In 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verse 14, we see Hezekiah commanding the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion to the priests and the Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. And in verse 5 of 2 Chronicles chapter 31, he says, And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, oil, and honey, and of all the increase of the field, and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. The key phrase there is, as soon as the commandment came abroad. One of the things you realize, the Bible says here is, it is a commandment. It wasn't a suggestion. It was something that they were commanded to do. And so, it was like a, a, an imposition on them. But they received it, and their reaction was very good. As soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel reacted. These were a people who didn't maybe know the instruction. But as soon as they heard it, they reacted positively. And in verse 9, a change took place and Hezekiah noticed. And when Hezekiah questioned with the priests and the Levites concerning the heaps, verse 10, and Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, answered him and said, since the people begin, began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord. 
since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord. Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord. Very important statement. Very true statement. Very analytical. They had recognized that since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, what happened? We have had enough to eat and have left plenty for the Lord had blessed his people and that which is left is this great store. There was abundance and there was a leftover of a great store. Note the significant change. The Lord had blessed them and honored them because they honored him. In Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9, the key, another key verse. It says, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So here, specifically, you are being told how to honor the Lord. How do you do it? Not just by lifting up your hands and singing a song, but by honoring the Lord with thy substance, with your substance, and with the first fruits, not the second fruits, not the third fruits, but the first fruits of all thine increase. So it is not enough just to bring a fruit. What honors the Lord is your first are you with me? Your first fruits. Because some people can bring their second. Some people can bring their third. And last week when we began the study of Abel and Cain, we found out the difference between Abel's offering and Cain's offering. The first recorded offering in the Bible is the offering of Cain and Abel. And by the law of first mention, we can make foundational deductions. When studying scripture, we need to be able to honor what is recorded as that which God intends for us to see and to learn from. And from Cain and Abel, we will also study the, the offering of Noah, which is a build up on the offering from Cain. And then we'll move to maybe the offering of Abraham and then to the law of tithe as well as other offerings before the law of Moses. Then we shall move to the New Testament. And looked at the practice in the New Testament of offerings, which was a change from the priesthood under the Levitical order to the establishment of the priesthood under the order of Melchizedek. So turn your Bible with me quickly, Genesis chapter 4, and let's read from verse 1 to verse 7. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. I have gotten a man from the Lord. I and mean, you can see the pride with which Eve talks about Cain. I've gotten a man from the Lord. I'm sure after the fall in the Garden of Eden, she thought the person she was going to bring forth was going to be the savior of the world who was going to defeat the devil and bring them out of captivity. And so with pride, she said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And I'm sure as Cain was also growing up, he also had this mentality that I am important because my parents give me pride. They make me feel important. And so he was going to go through life with a kind of entitlement mentality. But we have seen that usually people who have an entitlement mentality lose out, just like Jacob and Esau. Because you are the firstborn, you follow your natural right. And you don't prepare yourself to please God. You may easily take a lot of things for granted. Don't take your position and anything you do for granted when it comes to the Lord. May our lives honor the Lord. May what we do honor him. Don't take it for granted that you are a cell leader and begin to relax. Don't take it for granted that now you are a pastor and begin to come late. May we move away from the entitlement mentality and move in the service of of the Lord. And in verse 2, and she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Let's all read from verse 3 aloud. One, two, go. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Verse 4. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel 
and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Lift up your hand and say, I shall do well. Oh, come on, say it again. You see, when you do well, you don't have to be angry at somebody's prosperity or somebody's success. Don't blame, don't be jealous of other people when they are doing well. Learn from what they have done and also do well. So if somebody is doing well, it gives me hope that I can also do well. How? By looking at what he did. That made him, that gave him advantage and I also do well. Is somebody here with me? So the first principles are the foundations on which we build very important ideas or systems. They are like the foundations we, of a building which we establish in the ground and upon which we build up. Last week, I intimated to you, Adam and Eve were created by God and born in Eden, a place of harmony, a place of order, and a place of peace. Cain and Abel were the first human beings born of man and woman, and they were born outside Eden, a place of chaos and a place of pain. And that is the world we found ourselves in also, outside the Garden of Eden. They started their lives outside the Garden of Eden and give us a first impression of life outside Eden. But the story, as we have just read, does not focus on the age difference between Cain and Abel, but it now focuses on their careers and work and their offerings as very important things that is going to define them. Cain is introduced as a tiller of the ground or a crop farmer. And Abel is described as a keeper of sheep, someone who looks after sheep and goats. The focus on their work at this stage is very intentional and deliberate. God is showing us that these are not lazy people who are waiting for handouts or for somebody to come and give them their next meal. These are people who work hard and they make profit out of their work. So find that the first examples of two people born outside the Garden of Eden are working. Even before we talk about offering, God has looked at their work, their productivity, and how hard they work. So these are not lazy people. These are people who are working hard. Why is it important? Because you'll begin to understand how you take the fruit of your labor, not a handout, but the fruit of your labor, because in your offerings, your blood, your life, your energy must be part of your offering. Your offering is something you are putting on the altar. It is actually a replication of your life. So when they worked, they had put their energy and their effort into something and they had produced and gotten fruit. And it was out of the fruit that they were going to give an offering. If somebody hear me? You will begin to understand why David says, when David was going to give an offering, and somebody offered him free offering, he says, ah, 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 ah. I don't want to take anything free. I will not give unto God anything which doesn't cost me. Because he knows that when you just give things that you doesn't have your life and your blood in and it's your leftover and it's something that you just picked up. That offering doesn't speak. So you've got to understand that right from the beginning, the foundation, God is showing a people who work, who puts their life and their blood into something and get a fruit of it. They work hard at their vocations. After introducing them, now the narrative shifts to what they did with the reward from their work. And our attention is now directed to their offering. The word offering is first used in the Bible in relation with Cain and Abel. So we can get both the idea and the word. An offering represents a free will and solicited gift. It wasn't God who imposed upon them to bring an offering. 
So we are beginning to understand the first principles of an offering. It is a gift you are giving out. It is something that you are willing to give out. It is not a demand that is being placed on you. So if your offering is going to be acceptable to God, it must be something you want to give out. Imagine an offering is not an imposition. That is a legal requirement. But in this case, in the process of time, Cain brought an offering. And Abel also brought an offering. We have the impression of a free will and solicited gift. Why did they bring an offering? To show appreciation or to show affection. So why do you give? Because I want to appreciate you. Or because I want to say that I love you. You will find out that at this level and in the first few offerings in the Bible, there is nothing about a seed offering or an offering to give to get something or an offering because you want something so you are giving. It's free will. It's unsolicited. It's giving because I want to show appreciation and I want to also show affection. It is not a tribute, but it's a gift. What Cain and Abel brought was a gift willingly given. It wasn't a payment. It wasn't a reward. I'm sure after they had worked, they saw that there is a God in this work. Even though we have planted, we don't know how it came up. So we did our part, but we see God who has blessed the fruits, the, the crops, and they have grown, and they have borne fruit. I'm sure Abel saw that, ah, I've looked after sheep and goats. I didn't bring them onto this earth. I came to meet them. And some way, somehow, the sheep and the goats have reproduced, and they have had increase. They've seen fruit. And so they took of the fruits, the reward of their labor, and they were bringing it to the Lord. So there are three things we need to understand here. Number one, it was given to show appreciation of affection. Number two, it was a free will gift, never demanded or forced. The givers wanted to give it. It was initiated by them from their heart of appreciation and gratitude. And number three, the offering that they gave also had a a connotation of sacrifice. You see, they were giving up something they could have kept for themselves. They were giving up something of value. They were giving up something that was precious. They could have decided, let me keep it for myself. But they chose to sacrifice and to give it. They gave up something they had worked for and end. What did they offer? They offered the fruit of their labor. They recognized that their human effort had been blessed by God. Divinity had been involved. The seed had become a fruit. We called, I, I see the element of sacrifice in this offering of Abel and Cain in terms of the fact that they gave up something of value, something that was important to them. They gave up something that they had worked for and they gave it off willingly. The reward of their labor, of hard work, they were prepared to give it out. The crop farmer brought fruit of the labor and the sheep farmer also brought fruit. Now, there's another very interesting statement in verse 3. And I want you to look at it very carefully. Because it's also going to define offerings. Say with me, the offering of Anna. Hmm. Let's read verse 3 together. One, two, go. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Somebody say, unto the Lord. What did he bring? An offering unto the Lord. So the story here indica- indicates a place where they brought their offering. You see, they didn't give their offering where they worked. They brought their offering, you see, from this verse, it says there are two things you can infer. They brought their offering unto the Lord. They brought their offering unto the Lord. Or before the Lord. Two things can be inferred. Number one is they had an attitude in their hearts. That there was a consciousness when they were giving the offering. So in their hearts, it wasn't something they were just dropping anywhere. 
they brought their offering unto the Lord. There was a deep consciousness that what we are giving, we are giving to the Lord. There was a consciousness. You see, how many of us have a consciousness when you bring an offering that you are giving it to the Lord? I remember a few years ago, I called a young man and I said, do you give your offering to your church or you give it unto the Lord? It was a very interesting question. I hadn't even thought about it. But when I asked it, immediately struck me. Because you can give your offering to your church and you can give your offering to the Lord. You see, beyond the church need, there must be a consciousness that what you are giving is to the Lord. So when Cain and Abel brought their offering, number one, there was a consciousness that this offering, we are giving it to the Lord. Number two, there was also a designated place. Unto the Lord also means there's a place you take your offering. Not just anywhere. They did it with a spiritual awareness of God's presence and also in a place or in a spot that represented the presence of God. So they brought it to the place that was known that the Lord is here. The Lord is here. Can you understand that? That it wasn't just something that was just flimsy. As they were giving it, you know, sometimes as you watch people give an offering, you can tell those who are conscious of the fact that I'm giving it to the Lord and those who are doing it as a routine or a ritual that they have to put something into a bowl. The offering is being given unto the Lord. And we must be conscious that it is going to the Lord. That atmosphere or that consciousness will change the way you give offerings. It will be given out of respect. It will be given out of honor. It will be given, you will give something that you value. You will give something that to somebody you reverence. So they did it with the spiritual awareness of God's presence and they brought it before the Lord, unto the Lord, in a place or in a spot that represented the presence of God for them. This is very important and not to be overlooked. The offering could not be given casually. It had to be removed out of the place, out of where it was earned, its location, to a special place to be presented unto the Lord. You now understand why we come into the house of God. And what we do is secret. Because there's a consciousness. And number two, there's a place where God will receive offerings. The offering had to be taken from the place where it was produced or earned to another place where it could be offered to God. This is so central to the whole idea of worship. You have to move from where you are to a place where you can give your worship unto the Lord. The principal lesson is that offerings must be given in a designated place and they must be given as unto the Lord or before the Lord. And they brought their offerings unto God. Let's look at what the thinking was like. Number one, they took out part of their wealth they had created both Adam, both Cain and Abel, and denied themselves the use of it. They instinctively knew that part of what they produced belonged to God. Part of the fruit belonged to, get, belonged to God. There was a part where they worked, but there was a part where God blessed. And we all go through life with, with that awareness. We, 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 we sow the seed. Somebody waters, but God gives the increase. Are you with me? There's a part that you put in, but there's a part that also belongs to God. And so there's an awareness. So they took something, part of the world they had created. They denied themselves the use and said, this one belongs to God. Number two, they knew that they did not own everything they had and couldn't enjoy everything by themselves. Everything they had worked for. This knowledge is at the heart of every offering. It is core to the heart of every giver. When we believe that everything we have worked for, we own, you see, we begin to become stingy and we set ourselves on the path of stinginess. When we believe that God has blessed our work, 
When we believe that God has been good to us, you recognize him and you want to bless him and give to him. And it is that heart that you come to God with. We thought it was just an offering both of them had given till something changed permanently. Both of them seemed to be doing the right thing. Giving of the fruit of their labor. However, God did not respond to their offerings the same way. He made a distinction. God honored Abel's offering and rejected Cain. And so you say that the Bible says, And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. This is such a sobering and a grave judgment. Where God looks at two people and tells one person, I do not respect you. I do not like what you are doing. I do not accept what you have brought. That again is another whole thing. It means that not every offering and not everything we bring before God is accepted. So, this made me ask myself a a lot of questions. Are me and my offerings accepted before God? And I think it would be a good question for all of us to ask. Can you say that God has accepted your offering? You know, sometimes you are doing something that is right in your eyes, but it doesn't please God. So, Cain thought he was doing well. He had also worked. He has also taken part of it. He's also brought it to the place. He seems to be doing everything right, but at the end of the day, God says, "Uh -uh, I have respect unto Abel. I do not have respect unto Cain. Why did God respect Abel's offering and reject Cain? And how did they know who was accepted and who was rejected? In fact, when you look at the th- Cain's disappointment, it indicates that he thought that he had done well. So in a certain sense, it seemed good in his own eyes. What seemed good in his own eyes, however, was not right and was not accepted before God. Hey! This is interesting because now I'm beginning to understand the offering that will honor God. Every time I read in the Bible where God receives an offering, there is such a dramatic and drastic response from heaven that changes things on earth. And I've always wondered why sometimes ah, we give offering, we take pledges, and somehow we seem to be missing something. God, by his grace, is teaching us the foundational principles of an offering. And one of the key things is honor. Recognition that you are giving to God. Bringing it into a designated place where God is. is very important. Cain did not measure up. Why? Because offerings are more than just the money. Offerings actually reveal your heart toward God. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9. What does it say? Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Honor is how you feel in your heart about God. Honor is not just an act. It is a a deep-seated reverence about God and how you feel about him. Honor answers the question, what do I really think about this God? Does he deserve my first and best Is he really above every other person in my life? Is there somebody who is more important than God? Anna answers that question. Anna answers the question, how much I trust God? Is he trustworthy? Or I trust in myself and in my acquisitions? Anna says, God is bigger than me. I know I have worked. I know there are a lot of important people. But I regard God as bigger than even myself. It means that I place God above even myself. That's Anna. Because you can, you, you can decide to save the best for yourself. Sometimes you hear somebody who has worked very hard and decides that, you see, like there's a rich man in the Bible who said, I've worked hard and now it's time for me to enjoy, to bless myself. And the Bible says that in the night, he received a message and says, thou fool. Because he thought it was him. He, was not, he didn't recognize the God factor. Is somebody here with me? Is somebody here with me? You see, offerings are so cardinal to our faith that a priest, 
every priest, one of the things you do is you bring sacrifices and offerings before God. So if you don't understand this whole thing about offerings, your service to God will be missing a vital element. So it is important for all of us to grasp the essence of offerings. And the key foundation is honor. So can you, in the Bible, there was a focus on a few words that qualify the offering in Genesis chapter 4 verse 3. Let's look at it. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Verse 4. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. How was Cain's offering described? Just an offering. But you find out that when it comes to Abel's offering, there are adjectives that qualify what he did. What did he do? Firstlings. What did he do? The fat thereof. So all of them were involved in an act. One person brought of the fruit of the ground. The other person also brought the firstlings and the fat thereof. But look at it carefully. Because if you look at the word firstlings, it means the first of every animal. I mean, if you went to your farm and you were going to look for the first, it will take you a while to be able to say that this came first. That is first. That is first. So long before the offering was brought, there had been some care to select. He wasn't just picking something and bringing. He had now put some detail or attention to the detail. He was making sure that what I give to God, I'm looking among them and I'm picking the first. And the second qualification was that the fat. So he didn't just catch the first five. After catching the, all the first, then he looked for the fat thereof. It means that there was a lot of care. There was a lot of attention to detail. He was recognizing that this is not just an offering for an, a person. This is an offering of honor. You see, offerings are not something you just open your purse and look inside, see, 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 and then you pick something. No. Offerings to God, they are sacred. You will find out that long before Moses had even qualified the type of offerings to be brought, Cain and Abel had learned to go beyond the law. As we read Cain and Abel, Moses was not born. The law came with Moses. Tithe came with Moses. But now you are finding somebody who doesn't even, is not under the law, but out of his heart. Because in the beginning, this is how it was supposed to be. A heart giving. A heart that honors God. A heart that carefully appreciates God and selects and makes special preparations to give an offering of honor. An offering of honor. An offering of honor. So look at it. And the Bible says that, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. And when Cain got, Cain got angry and his countenance fell, God says, listen, if you do well, will you not be accepted? So it means that Cain knew. In fact, in, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, the Bible describes Cain's works as evil. It means that Cain knew, but he made a choice. As for me, this is what I can give, so I'm, I'm sending it there. So he still obeyed a part of it, but his finishing was bad. What he brought was something he just collected. It wasn't a bad offering. But what he brought did not have the element of respect and honor. And I'm going to show you a few things. Because after a while, God speaks to the Israelites and says, if you think your offering is respectful, go and give it to your boss. Go and give it to your king. And see whether he will accept it. And see whether you have favor. So why do we give to God what doesn't have respect? The sad part is, I've seen people give offerings and it's been an empty envelope. I've seen people who, because nobody was watching, put in maybe toilet paper, or lotto paper. 
You see, and you think nobody sees. In this offering, there was no congregation. There was no pastor. There was nobody clapping for them. But they did it before God. Some people will only give well because they are human people. They are human beings around. There's human recognition. But immediately it's a secret. You will find the hearts of people are released. But the maturity is for us to take a secret offering and to find people's hearts. Without any special environment around of clapping of who will do this and who will do that, you will see people's hearts about God. When I started studying this, I had to pray and say, Father, forgive me. The first thing I had to ask was, Father, forgive me. For the many times I have done things recklessly in your presence. For the many times I have trivialized your offerings. And I realized as we take offerings, offerings are a cardinal part of our faith. They are sacred. It's sacrosanct. It is reserved for God. It is willing. It is unsolicited. It is given freely. It is given sacrificially. We deny ourselves and we give it to God and we give him our first and our fat. Because we place him above ourselves. That's worship. That's the beginning of your relationship. That God is above me. That God is bigger than me. That this God is too good. It's more than a song. And so you find out that the first recorded offering in the Bible reveals a lot of foundational truths. The text does not simply only record what the two of them offered. One offering was an act of distinction. It was a superior offering, offering of firstlings and fats. The quality was related to more than just the offering itself. It also now revealed the heart and the attitude with which it was given. Wow. The care and the heart behind the offering. And God responded. Cain was rejected. Abel was accepted. Because God looked beyond the act and looked at the heart. Is somebody here with me? Is somebody here with me? So the heart behind the offering, God sees. The motive behind the offering, to honor God. Whilst the offering of Cain is mentioned without any detail of quality, Abel's offering is described with an emphasis on detail and quality. First links and fat thereof. First links and fat thereof. Beyond what was offered, the detail describes the quality and the attitude. It was not just fruit or an offering. It was the first. It was what? It was what? It wasn't the second. It wasn't the third. He didn't say, I have more important things than, so when I finish this, then I'll do this. No, 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 no. He was the first. God is the first. Can we say as a church, God is first in our lives. God is going to be first in our lives. Because sometimes you eventually bring it, but it's not the first, it's the second, it's the third. It's after you've done everything, then you think about him. You see, long before you bring it, he sees, he knows, he feels it. Is that how important I am to you? Is that how you really see me? Do you trust me or you trust yourself? Do you honor me above all these other things? My first and my fat. So it was the first fruit and it was fat. You can see the care to select the offering is being revealed. And the heart of reverence and the honor long before they presented it to the place. That's very interesting, isn't it? So it is not so much the amount that was given. It was the attitude and the quality behind the offering that is being revealed. Is somebody hearing me? Okay. So not every offering or sacrifice is accepted before God. It is possible to fall short even when we seem to be doing 
the right thing in our own eyes. It is, positive to, it is possible to give to God and have him reject what you give. Abel was accepted because he gave the first and the fat. He honored God above himself. The gift was given consciously first to God. First to God. First to God. Carefully selected and set aside to honor God. Now let's look at something behind the offering again. This willing and solicited gift was given to a God who had expelled the appearance from the garden. So the parents of Cain and Abel had had a bad experience where God had sucked them from the garden. So the people had moved from a blessing into hustle. Hey! Then their children grew up and they are bringing an offering to this God who had expelled their parents. They did not give out of bitterness for God moving them out of and ejecting them out of garden. They gave out to God in spite of their father's sins. In spite of the fact that their parents had had a bad experience. So you see, it is possible you can go through a bad experience and still, sometimes people go, hey, what I've been through this year? Hey, you see their attitude? You don't understand what I've, hey, Charlie, Charlie, don't, don't even, talk. you see, long before, look at the heart. Look at the attitudes. Look at the, the memories. Look at the negativities. This is not time for, this not, don't, don't even talk. And sometimes, many pastors find it difficult to preach about offerings because the attitude can be so negative. But offerings, when they are properly given, they will provoke heaven on earth. You see, and when I talk about offering, I'm not just restricting it to maybe money. I'm also restricting it to your labor, your service, your attitudes, your gestures. That if it is God, I'll do my best, better than any other place. If it is God, I will do it first before any other thing. I will make time for God. Why? Out of honor. I have a lot of things to do, but I'm going to make some time and give it to God. When I wake up in the morning, the first thing I want to do is to just honor God with a prayer or with a song of worship. You see, things done early and things done first. So when you wake up in the morning, worship him. Thank him. First, the first thing is not to check your WhatsApp. The first thing is not to do your, what the, the first thing, honor the Lord with your first, your fresh energy, your first, the fat, the freshest. In Mark chapter 14, or let's look at John chapter 12, verse 3. John chapter 12. And let's see a very interesting attitude towards giving. In John chapter 12, verse 3 to 6. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put in therein. You see, when people begin to criticize what is being done for the Lord, you've got to be careful about them. You've got to be careful. So when somebody comes to church and maybe honors the Lord with 100,000, 1 million or something, you see, all of a sudden, hey, why, why shouldn't you go and, why shouldn't you use the, go and evangelism and feed the poor? You see, the person who is talking like that, he's actually showing you his mindset about God. He values the poor more than his salvation. He thinks he's more interested in the people than God who sent his son to come and die for them. When you come into the house of God and you see something nice, you are angry. Some people are angry. Why should a church buy a microphone? Why should a church buy a, 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 a projector? It's a waste of money. And people who talk like that, you see, you should be careful if you have friends like that because they are actually revealing to you their heart and their attitude. Everything nice in the house of God, they will talk. 
and they themselves will never want to do anything nice for God. Because they think when they have money and they have nice things, they should use it on the world. They should use it in their bathroom. They should use it in their hall. They should change their furniture. And they criticize everything. And so they keep changing their furniture and their hall and their shoes and everything. And yet, when it comes to giving something to God, you will find out that they are loud and they are critical. May God help us remove every dishonor out of his offerings. Because this is what Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's sons, this is what they did. And God said, "Uh -uh, I'm changing my mind about you. May God look at powerhouse and smile and honor us. Because our offerings are pure. Their attitude is pure. We, We have a good heart. We want to give to the Lord to honor him. And so when David was blessing his son and giving instructions for his son, he gave his son Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9. He says, Charlie, aside all things, honor the Lord and honor him with your substance and honor him with your first fruits. Honor the Lord. Honor the Lord. This is good advice of a king who had been brought from the bush into the palace. And he's teaching Solomon. Solomon is also leaving instructions for his children. He says that, Charlie, there's something you must all learn under the Lord with your substance. Don't take it out of your service. Don't take it out of your life. Let God, let the world see. Let God know that you value him. Let God understand that you respect him. Let God begin to see gratitude under the Lord with your substance. So the great attitude in the house of God is as God blesses us and promotes us, you see that our offering should go up. Unfortunately, you can't say that for a lot of people. As they begin to get money, as their jobs increase, they struggle with tithe, even tithe. As God begins to bless them, they get per diem. Now they are tithe three, four, five, six months. Even years, they don't pay. You see? You are struggling with something in your heart. So in the New Testament, the Bible teaches us you cannot, honor, you cannot serve God and mammon. I, I hope I'm teaching something. And I hope you don't find it offensive. Be- because we must shift. We must move to the level where we honor God and God honors us. You see, I want to see people who are being honored by God. You are a shepherd boy, but you are now in the palace. Beyond your education, beyond your politics, beyond your background, God has just honored you. Not because of your beauty, not because you went to school, but the honor of the Lord because you honored him with your life. Where God just blesses you beyond your imagination. Where God gives you wisdom that is beyond your education. Where kings and nobles come to, come to you for counsel because God has honored you and given you wisdom and you are solving problems even as a slave in a strange land. You are in prison, but God has honored you and will make you the president or the vice president in Egypt. You didn't go to school, but look, I mean, God has just blessed you. You have wealth, and you are employing people who went to school. So, we, it's important. When God blessed Abel, all of a sudden, Cain noticed that actually something has changed about my brother. Something has changed. And he knew that it was the offering that they gave that had changed it. He knew. It is important. Offerings are a representation of yourself. Your offerings have to be spotless. But Cain's offering was polluted with sin and unbelief. It revealed their spiritual state. And it showed their heart motive and intent. The quality of what they presented to God was the quality God also saw about them. God saw through their offerings and responded to them accordingly. And the impact of their offerings affected them directly. The impact of Cain's offering affected him directly. He became a murderer. And the impact of Abel's offering affected him. He became wealthy. He became blessed. You see, you you are your offering. You are a reflection of your giving. Of your offering. Is somebody here with me? Yes. 
That's how sacred offerings are. The blessing and reaction was noticeable. God asked Cain, why are you angry? You know the right thing to do. Just do it. Don't hide it. Honor God. You know that God also wants your dollars. God also wants your pounds. God also wants your euros. Come and honor God with your substance and say, God, you've blessed me. And honor God with your substance. Your substance is not just for a political party. Your substance is not just for a football club. Your substance is not just for family funerals and meetings. Your substance is for the house of the Lord to give him honor. To give the Lord honor. In the very first recordings of offerings, we see the example of those who make sacrifices to please God and yet miss the mark. And we see that those who sacrifices please God. Here we learn the act of making sacrifices or giving an offering by itself is not enough. So let us summarize a few lessons. Number one, what we bring as an offering should be the work of our hands or something we have gained by working. Your life must be in the offering. And that is why David said, I will not give to God that which costs me nothing. Because if your life is not in the offering, there's no blood. It doesn't carry light. Number two, the kind of offering that is pleasing to God must be the first and best of all our produce, our earnings, our re- 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 rewards, which we meticulously set aside. You see, we select it. We pick the fat. We pick the first links. I, I want us as a church, and I'm going to provoke God, that let us as a church begin to practice this and watch from now till maybe the, the first half of the year and watch what God will do. I'm saying to God, this is your word. Confirm it in Choco. Change the destinies of people. Open doors that are unimaginable. Bless them. Things that are impossible with, their, with, with, with generations before us. Father, make and use your people in Choco. As we honor you, honor us. Number three, offerings must be given before or unto the Lord in a place designated for him or with an attitude in a spirit dedicated to him. We are conscious. We are not just putting something in the bowl and just because there's a need. No, we are conscious that we are giving it to God. Every time there's offering being taken and you come around, just say, thank you, Father, receive this from me. This offering is for you, Father. Every time you take money from your, 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 your pocket, lift it up before God and say, this is for you. God, this one is for you. Be conscious. Number four. Offerings must be motivated by a desire to honor God and not to please ourselves or any other person. So we don't give because they are raising funds and we want people to see us. Or we want to satisfy ourselves that today I've given. Let's give to honor God. My offerings must honor God. Number five. Our offerings represent our character to God. He sees our heart through what we willingly offer to him. He sees who we are through what we give to him. Number six. Not all offerings are acceptable to God. Our offerings must always meet God's standards for them to be acceptable to him. And number seven, when God accepts our offerings, he shows respect to us and he responds in a tangible way to show his acceptance. When it comes to our finances, this can be seen by our dependence on money to save us from trouble or blaming our lack of money on our troubles. God is bigger than money. Say with me, God is bigger than money. Oh, come on, say, my God is bigger than money. You know, one of the things I was taught to do early as a child of God was to take money uh, and put it down on the floor. So let's say, you know, how many of you, I'm sure if you have dollars and pounds, you're always keeping it somewhere. But one of the things I learned how to do early was to take money and step on it and put it under my feet. Trample on it and say it's nothing. It's paper. 
You see, when money, you, you hold money in a certain way, it will control you. You should be able to take thousands of cities and spread it on the floor and work on it. And I want to suggest to all of you to do things like that. Take $200, $1,000, put it on the floor and work. It's nothing. What we're actually saying is that I'm bigger than you. And my God is bigger than you. I can't do that to God. But when somebody is holding 100 cities or $100, hey. Or 100 pounds, pounds. It's like, tell me, oh, 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 100 pound, 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 pound. No, 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 no. You see, because he hasn't learned how to put money under his feet. Is somebody hearing me? And, and that is why we have a problem. Because unless you can control it, you can't give it. And sometimes you've got to deliberately master what you fear. So if you fear 10,000, give it. You see, break the control over you. If you deliberately, if you fear 1,000, Break the control over you. you see, so you can break into another level and threshold of blessing. And that is why you find out that when there is a certain type of giving, there is a certain type of God. Did you hear that? And I don't mean God has changed. I mean he reveals himself in a greater way. Because the people have honored God above their earnings. So let's see. My time is almost up, but let's just look at a few things about some attitudes that must change for money. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17. For an offering to honor the Lord. I thought I'll be able to finish this. It doesn't look like it. So I may have to do a part two next week. Oh God. Or maybe I'll do it during the week. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17 and 18. And you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power. So there's a contrast between your power and your might and God who gives you power. Can you see it? You see, somebody has worked and says, you, you made a mistake and said, it is my power and my might, my education and my energy that has gotten me this. But he says, you shall remember that it is not your might and your power. It is God that giveth thee the power to get wealth. Why? That he may establish his covenant, which he swore unto us this day. So one of the battles all of us will have to learn to confront and overcome is the attitude that it's me, it's me, it's me. No, it is God that giveth thee power. I hope I'm teaching something today. You see, you've got to be able to come over it to be able to honor the Lord with your substance and to give the first, your first, and honor God. It is you that gave me the breakthrough. It is you that opened the door for me. You are first in my life. And so this one is for you. That's honor. That's honor. And you find out that when you begin to put God first, seek him first, and all other things, because once you put him first, he provokes something that brings all other things. Think about this for a few minutes. Did you create your life? And can you preserve it? Hmm. Did you create the planet you live on? Did you create goats and apples and oranges and monkeys or chocolates. Did these things just happen by chance? No, 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 no. For example, I'm looking now at my microphone. Did the microphone just come here, appear by chance? No, I didn't create it, but I'm using it. How did that little mass of plastic and electronics appear? Like all creation, there's some intelligence and planning that has gone into it. Though I have a few ideas, I don't know who created it, where it was created, or how it was created. But that does, mean, does that mean that it just came into existence? No. Just because you don't know exactly where or how it came into existence, doesn't mean it just happened. There is a God. There is a creator. There is a producer. There is a manufacturer. And we give him reverence by honoring him. 
We don't assume that just because we are here, we are working. The energy just came. The brains just came. The wisdom just came. There is a God who gives wisdom. There is a God who gives life. When you wake up in the morning and you can shake your body and shake your body, remember that it's not because you are smart. There is a God who gives life. And we must honor him. We must honor him. Turn your Bible to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1 from verse 6 to 10. And maybe, I think we may just have to end with this for now. I wanted to talk about Noah, but time is up. A son honoreth his father. <laughs> Let's all read it together. One, two, go. A son honoreth his father. Say it again. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. Then he says, if then I be a father, where is my honor? So a son, huh? he's not somebody who just grows up. When you become a son, you honor your father. So he says, if you say that I'm your father, if you've grown up, you are no longer a child, you've grown up and matured, as you mature and you start thinking and you start asking yourself a lot of questions, you will honor your father. You know, for, if you are, when, you are not, when you are a child, it's very interesting to wake up in the morning and ask for food. You don't know what your mother goes through to cook and to complain when there's no food. But when you grow and you also marry and become a mother, you begin to understand. Uh -huh. How did my mother pay my school fees? from class one, class two, feed me three times a day. How, how did they buy me clothes? How did they provide water? How, how, how? When, when you're a child, you don't think like that. But when you become a son and you recognize what it has taken, you honor your father. I am happy that as my father grew older, I, grew, I got closer to him. That's one of the things. When he died, I was happy. I was, I mean, I was at peace. Because I had seen how a father could have nine children. And how he sent all the nine of us to school. No one was left behind. And I asked myself, me, I'm paying school fees for three people. How did my father do it? How did they provide food for nine of us morning, afternoon, evening? We were complaining the food was not enough. But how did he do it? Me, I have three. So you see, I began to place value. And I began to honor him. Because I had seen what he had done. You don't just get up and talk when you haven't been proven and think you are better. <laughs> I saw a pastor who was starting a church and he was laughing at some pastors in a classroom. And I said to him, these pastors in the classroom have been there for 10 to 15 years. You are just starting. At least for 15 years they have survived in the ministry. After one year, he ran away. So it's very easy. When you don't pastor to come and stand and say, eh, people are not coming to church. The pastor is not good. And you wait. When you have survived 25 years. So because sometimes you think you are better. So you have to go through and walk in their steps. And then you salute them. A son honors his father. And a servant his master. <laughs> if then I be a father, why is my honor? And if I be a master, why is my fear? Say the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests. You see, so he was talking to the priest, but he was using the analogy of a master and a servant and a father and a son. And he says, O priest, you despise my name. When you hear my name, it's as if now you are angry. And they said, How did we despise your name? And he said, you offer, you see, it's coming back to offerings again. You offer polluted bread upon my altar. Things that you don't like. Things that you won't give to any other person. That's how you, you see, I, I'm, he's seen your character through your offering. He's seen your attitude about him through your offering. You offer polluted bread and you say, wherein have we polluted you? In that you say the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor 
and see if you'll be pleased with thee or accept thy person, say the Lord of hosts. So he says, you want your prayers answered. But look at the way you, when it comes to offering, you want breakthroughs, but when it comes to offering, he says, go and offer it to your governor and see if he will even listen to you. Go and offer it to your gun manche. Go and offer it to your kwewu manche and see if you have his the ability to step before him. What this teaches us. Before the Lord will listen to you, your offerings must be accepted. That is why usually when we are going before a king, we send a gift before we appear. And I'm a chief, so I understand it. <laughs> Every time I'm going to see my head chief, I put something under the carpet before I go. Why? Because unless your gift is accepted, unless you learn how to master offerings, unless your heart is pure and you have a heart of reverence to God, you may come and shout, hey, la baba, hey, la baba, hey, la baba. But you see, your person is not even accepted. You don't have a right to be there. Before the high priest will enter into the Holy of Holies, the offering, he had to enter with blood for himself. Otherwise, he can't access God. Offerings of honor. And so look at what he says, verse 9. And now I pray thee, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This has been your means. Will he regard your persons? Say the Lord of hosts. Who is there even among you that will shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire on my altar for naught. Then he says, I have no pleasure in you, say the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. So because of the attitude, if anybody comes before God and does something he wants to charge, you see, he wants to take. It is not just about the charge. It is an attitude that before I do anything for the Lord, I must get something back. So I will never give till he's prepared to give me something. I will never come and serve him till he gives me something. I will never come for prayer meeting till I want something. So for some people, the only time they come before God, they want something. So it's like God is a gambler. If I give him, he must give me. If I pray, he must answer. If I do this, he must do this. There's never a heart to honor God. So unfortunately, when people don't have a need, they think they don't need God. So I don't need anything. So that's why I'm not coming to pray. I'm okay. I'm married. I'm a husband. I have my children. I'm paying my school fees. I have a good job. So the first day is not for me. You see? But it is revealed. And so he says, when it comes to even shutting the door, it's like, what will God do for me? When it comes to lighting fire, what will God do for me? Because the heart of Anna is missing. Church, let us come back to Anna. I pray, as we fast, may something turn, may something change about this church. May we be a church that honors the Lord. May the honor of the Lord fill this house. May God receive honor with our service. May we honor the Lord with our substance. May we honor the Lord with our offerings. May we honor the Lord with our first and best. May we come before God and sing in honor. May we come to church and, and receive him with honor. May we live our lives in a way that honor the Lord. May our offerings honor you. The heart of a true worshiper, we cry out in the spirit and say that, Father, may we grow in honor because as we honor you, you will honor us. Rise up on your feet. You want to lift up your hand and just say that, Lord, I just want to worship you. The foundation of true worship is an act of honor. Starts with honoring God. How you see him. How do you see God? He's bigger than me. He's bigger than my money. He's bigger than, he's bigger. And Lord, I want to honor you with my life. Just lift up your hand and say that, Lord, I want to honor you with my life. In the name of Jesus, I just want to honor you with my life, Lord. Take glory, Lord. Receive honor this morning from grateful hearts. Receive honor from grateful hearts. We honor you, Lord. May your name be honored. May your name be magnified in this place, in our lives, in our actions, in our speech, in everything we do. In Jesus' name. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. 
Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away, Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart and I give you my soul. I live for you. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless you. I trust that you are blessed by the word. We look forward to seeing you again next week, Sunday, same time, same place. And I also want to encourage you that you can join us on Tuesday as we build our faith with the spoken word, which we preach by our dear pastor, Pastor Bernard, every Tuesday, available on Facebook. You can like, you can comment, share with your friends and family. Until then, I pray and I trust that you have a great week. I trust you into God's hands and that he will guide you, order your steps, and that goodness and mercy will follow you. Thank you so much again for joining us and have a blessed week. In Jesus' name, amen.